All right, my friends, happy Friday to you guys. We've got a special virtual press event with our boys from RSL Speakers. We've got Howard Rogers. We've got the founder of, of RSL. we got Drew Callen. we got Don Dunn from HD 2020. And somebody's, right. Haven's Mark. somebody's audio is playing right now. That's mine. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> amateur mistake. Anyways, guys, it's awesome to have you here on our channel. Howard, you and I have known each other for quite some time. I think this is the first time we've been on camera face to face. It's great to see you. I love the fact, the whole premise of your company, what you guys do, the whole story behind it. You're, you guys have kind of been in the industry for a long time, probably longer than most people realize. So I'd like to get a little history of RSL speakers. I'd like to get a background from Howard as well as Drew. Drew, you're kind of new to me. I've only known yeah, you maybe for a few months, but you've got some knowledge on loudspeaker design. I definitely <laughs> want to pick your brain on, and I want to talk about some of these new products that are coming out. And why the hell is the Speedwoofer 10S so damn good for the money? <laughs> Howard, do you want to you want to start us off about some? You're muted, Howard. Howard. I think how uh, you're muted, you're muted, Howard. He's the silent partner. <laughs> <laughs> Quiet man, yeah, your mic is still muted for some reason. It, did, is it on the mic, Howard? The mute button. Or so, anyways, phone guys, phone? I um, okay. while he's <laughs> figuring that out, I want to show this. I want to show this uh, commercial or this ad that you guys ran, the Roger <laughs> Sound Labs Hi-Fi Painkiller for the relief <laughs> of minor pain related to setting up your audio system. This is pretty okay. funny. This is AK. This is a la 1970. Okay, so one of the things I know Howard can elaborate on is um, that having uh, established RSL and building a retail storefront to sell factory direct speakers was a business model is I call them we're calling them the OG of factory direct really because seriously, what he saw back then and what we're doing today it's the same business model, except instead of a retail store, we have Internet Direct. You talk to the people when you call in uh, that help you out with you know, solving a problem, a connection. And this resonates because it has like speaker placement considerations. It has all these little old school references you know, with hand art. And Howard's always one to not take it, not take life too seriously, you know. So right. that's, that, that's what's hey, so hey. awesome about it. So, Howard, you're still on mute, I guess. But... He's still on mute. I don't know. It was... is, is it in the bar, Howard, where it says stop cam, mute settings? So, I would try to uh, just get out of StreamYard and come back in, Howard, and see if it fixes the yeah. problem. But yeah. you know what? While he does that, Drew, why don't we get some background on your yeah, expertise? So, so my, I, I started in the business uh, in the uh, late 90s. And actually, out of college, the Howard was my first uh, opportunity and gig. I had, uh, been doing my, my own thing too, independently, but Howard, uh, invited me in. He, I think, or, uh, the engineer at the time who hired me, my boss, uh, I think it was Jerry McClintock was his name back in the day. He had heard some speakers that I, we worked at a common place. He had heard the speakers that I had built and went through it. And, you know, just some of those things are starting off that way. I evolved to getting hired on at uh, Roger Sound Labs. And then from there, we it really took off. Howard and I had a very uh, similar desire to, to really uh, provide the best speakers at the best price, the best value, perform it, all those things. And it was real world. It wasn't, you know, performance. There's a point we call like diminishing returns that, mm -hmm. uh, that we have it on a, on a scale. And we try to find that point where there, you start getting to a point of, uh, okay, there's significant diminishing returns here. To put more money into it is really not smart. Let's, let's put as much content. And by being factory direct, where we don't have dealers, middleman, any of those things, the caliber of the, con of the materials we could use and, and really get you know, better performance than what was out there. And that, that messaging and, and the real world aspect of, of literary listen first measure second and listen measure you know all those things we go through 
it started with you know Howard myself on there. So Howard, you still show as as muted. He, he is muted. Did you try to log back in? Okay, now we're gonna do sign language. Nod your head if you hear. Did you did you log out? Okay. okay. You want me to come down and check it out? He's he's downstairs in our in our building. Okay. Uh, yeah, he's probably know. just the mute button. You can tell yeah. this is live. <laughs> yeah, it's real live. And it, what's funny is what probably probably knows we were talking freely just before you started yeah, it. So I, know. It's great. I don't know what happened here. Yeah. But regardless, so so that that was my start there, and it just grew from there because we always everything went to the listening room, and then back then, you know, doing like electrical impedance measurements in the eighties was. Good old fashioned oscilloscope, calibrated resistor. Can you hear me now? Oh, we hear <laughs> yeah, you loud and clear. Okay. Okay. And then calibrated resistor and planoscope, finding that phase uh, phase crossing and putting the dots on a graph paper <laughs> and literally plotting a curve. And then and the first system I had was an IQS uh, test system, which was an 8 bit. And the frequency response graphs were asterisks on, on, on oh a dot God, matrix yeah. printer. You know, back. So, so there was a lot. And but I always love the fact that, and I that I developed some custom uh, tools to help my job better because there, there wasn't a tool to design a loudspeaker or design a tr anything really much back then. It was all the the pay AES papers that are out there that had the formulas and had all the stuff, and we you know, grab that and you, you know it's not it wasn't commonplace. I gotcha. So, so, that, so that, how, that's just how it started, really. But Howard, so now that we got Howard back on, I guess. Am I still a, on? Yeah, you are here. Okay, give us a little deal. history lesson of RSL, because uh, you guys started like in 1976 ish. 70. Right? 70. 1970. 1970. Wow. Yeah. Um, I was born. All right, I'll give you a, a brief background first. You know, one of the main purposes why we do this. Um, I think can be summed up from a recent email that I'd like to just share a little bit of, uh, from that we got a few days ago. And uh, this customer said, my uncle, when he was in the 80s, decided to purchase an audio system for his downstairs recreation area. And I recommended RSL and a Yamaha receiver. Um, he says, Howard patiently helped make this decision. And even though he hesitated a few times, he eventually made the purchase. He was so proud of his system. He had a movie watching party for his neighbors to watch Black Panther. He just passed away at 93 years old. And I just want to say thanks to wow. RSL and Howard for taking care of him. I appreciate it. To me, that's why we're in business. That just sum, yeah. sums up the whole thing. Here, here. Um, right but on. As far as the background, um, try to make it short. Uh, I became interested in audio around 1961. Um, my father helped me uh, start the business, but he taught me a lot about retail. He had a retail store and it didn't sell audio. It was in a different field, but his attitude was the customer is always right. Don't forget it, who puts the food on your table. Never forget that. And that's always been uh, the philosophy. So uh, in the late 1960s, I was working for uh, a speaker company that made speakers and actually sold them uh, through, through a shop and realized that, hey, they're, they're making cheap speakers with cheap parts and selling them at a low price. And I was looking at them and saying, you know what? It doesn't cost that much more for a better magnet. It doesn't cost that much more for a quality crossover or a better cabinet. We can still sell them at a low price. And that's what we uh, decided to do is to just build better speakers. And that led to um, a store where we did that and sold some components with, with it. Uh, we built them really well and they caught on and a lot of uh, studios and radio stations um, and TV stations wound up getting them. And, and that kind of uh, tells it from there. And, and we get all the time people saying, yeah, I got some of your speakers from the 1970s and they're still going strong. And, and that's what I live for. And I lo yeah. love to hear, love to hear that. So that, that that kind of tells uh, a little bit about of our background. It's the short form. <laughs> I got you. Yeah. So you have a presentation here. I think we should get into that because there's some interesting information in here as well as new product info as well. So here we are, Roger Sound Lab. Yeah, I might. Yeah. The print is a bit small to see, so I'm going to zoom yeah. in here. So, so just well, so this right here is like we. I didn't realize when we say 50 years, it's actually more than 50 years, but. 
it spans from uh, the six decades, you know, at least right now as of today. And and that first upper left image is the a photo that uh, we found, <laughs> and it's the it's the the one that's had best focus. There was nothing else. But I I asked if we had one, and Howard found one, and he had that he had that one. But that's where it started. So the and the great thing about the factor deck model is it's and Howard can explain this better, but it's instant feedback. You know, most speaker companies, if they have dealers or distribution network, they're detached from the customer. We talked, I talked to the customer all the time. And as much, like I have designs, we have features to put in there, oh, technology, whatever it may be. What happens is I realize very quickly, like, well, well that didn't work. But my idea for this terminal type uh, really didn't work. I need to make sure the next design has something that can uh, be easier for the customer, you know. So that tangible thing makes our constant improvement of products and design that like much to add, add, add just a, a little bit to that. Yeah, I spent a lot of years on the sales floor and we would come out with a new speaker. It'd be introduced on the sales floor right away and I'd be playing them for customers. I could read their body language. I could tell what they like and didn't like. And I think that's different than some of the corporate models now that where a big corporation will have people design speakers, test great in their sound in their rooms. And then when they release, there'll be a time lag between the time that they can go out and actually start to talk to sales dealers and salespeople and ultimately the customer. And, um, so I think that that experience has been really valuable and I'm thankful that I've had it. It's and interesting I, that we see this so often in the industry and Don can attest to this as well. Small company like RSL gets bought out. The people yeah. that buy it don't manage it properly. They run it in the ground. Run <clears> it <throat> to the ground, try to live off of the, the name brand or the reputation. Yep. You guys have a comeback story because you came back. You saw this. You saw you weren't happy with what was going on. You came back. And then yeah. Drew came back as well. I didn't know Drew. Yeah. I didn't realize you were involved so early on with RSL. Yeah. yeah, that was, like I said, that was my first stop, first career stop. But what's neat about it is so much has stuck with me from that first and resonated throughout my career. And I owe that to Howard, you know, just having that time with him on that side. And literally the, the engineering lab and facilities test and measurement was in the same building as our, one of our major headquarter retail stores. So mm -hmm. literally, I could see what was happening, go into upscale audio section of it, listen to some really nice setup and equipment and compare with like at the time, I think Sonus Favor was a new brand that came out at, in the in the late 80s or whatever. And you name it, there was all that we I had access to all that. So we could test and measure competitors and retail everything we wanted. So it was like I would just had. I had, you know, the run of it. I could do whatever we needed to do to, to uh, characterize, listen, compare. So right. it was a unique, it was a unique setup. So, and then, and then Howard, I think it was all, how, how many years before they ran into the ground, Howard, the, the corporate, the investment um, group that bought it? Well, I, I, I left in originally in 1990 and it didn't take them long <laughs> they, <laughs> to make all the changes, you know, but. And I remember, I remember Howard calling me, saying, you know what, I can't let anyone else get this. This is ridiculous that they'd run to the ground. I, and he just made sure that he acquired the, all the rights and the brand and everything. Because what you described, Gene, was what so many companies do. They just fall under a brand umbrella. And it's nothing at the core of the same values or same performance or attributes. Mm -hmm. It's just the brand, the name, the logo that goes on it. Well, the thing you can say here is the logo that goes on it is in the original founder's you know, ownership. And yeah. Um, and that's it, it, it. It makes a difference for us to to be able to say we stand behind our stuff. We've stood behind our stuff for fifty years, for as long as we've done this, and we will continue always to stand behind our. Well, I, I want to add something, and I don't want to sound mushy, but this is the honest truth. I had a lot of technicians working with me in the older days because I had to uh, wear a lot of hats, and I needed the help in that regard. And without a doubt, Drew was the brightest. He got what we did the best. And it's been my dream for over three decades to get him back someday. And we're realizing that dream. And, and in that period of time, um, you know, he's mentioned some of the experience that he had, he only grew in stature and we just feel real, real lucky.
It's interesting that it, your heritage, your legacy products or your vintage products were, were actually large box products, mm -hmm. which you don't do now. Um, obviously, well, some, a, a lot of that has technology evolution because now we've got powered subwoofers and you could offload that base and put them in the right locations yeah. in the room and instead focus yeah. on a very high quality monitor. Better wife acceptance factor, but also better potential base integration as well. Yeah, but we, we're not ignoring, I'll call the, what's the retro trend mm -hmm. <laughs> that we see out there. And uh, so don't be surprised also in the future, if we don't take a step aside to be able to do what we're so well, what people know us for in the heritage of what you talked about, a, a larger, large studio monitor or something, uh, you know, with a 12 inch three way or something like that. That's not out of our, our planning, but would it, would I consider it? Uh, true home theater uh, ideal setup probably not but we know we haven't gone down that route however for a, a two speaker setup no sub just something simple decorative you know stylized retro but uh, by all means we'll consider that sure <laughs> so I, you know our team has grown pretty quickly i mean it's it's a relative like i said it's a family run business uh both my son and uh howard's son both work at our company uh, I have four sons, uh, and they, they're on their own careers now and everything and, and whatnot. But uh, a uh, Andrew is his name. He handles our customer service. Uh, Joe, obviously, part owner, he handles all the sales. Mm -hmm. And we have, you know, a strong web development team. And so we're, you know, we're growing, and uh, it's, it's, it's challenging, especially with COVID during these times when trying to get – you know, you couldn't really hire, you know, and, and you know, everything was remote and to do stuff remote in our business, it's such a organic type of thing where, you know, you, you're listening in the same room, evaluating, sharing feedback and test and measurement space and all that stuff. So, yeah, someone's asking if you sell in Europe and I wasn't I wasn't even sure if you did. Yeah. Or not. So, well, actually, so one of the things I, this is this is where the factory direct or slash Internet direct model really shines because. We are now negotiated rates because our, our, we've done more. So many more people have asked just that. We now have such demand that we are direct internationally to most countries. Oh. Okay, which is surprising. So we've had inquiries from numerous distributors, but logistically, to structure the the value proposition that we try to maintain, it's really hard doing that international distribution because some of the added costs. However, our costs <laughs> plus the shipping it's still much less than it would be if we had a distributor in place that had to make his margin. So we can do international direct at very, very competitive and compelling pricing. So, gotcha. so that's why, it, you know, it's a good question because we get asked that a lot. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I can't, I can't probably have to look a little closer, but so this page, you know, I wanted to share, you know, Gene, I don't want to tell me if I'm, I, I jabber on a lot. So just stop me if you want to interject. Oh, sure. <laughs> but, okay. <laughs> So our design philosophy, we take, you know, our stuff, this is to the heart at the core because we eat, breathe, sleep this stuff. This is, you know, you know, what I've done for 30 years. And, uh, and I, I'm trying, what I tried to do is share a little bit of Rockford's uh, uh, philosophy and, you know, how we do, why we do it. And because companies uh, succeed or fail, due to often, most often due to lack of process control. Like, like if you don't have a way to do things, then who are you? What's your DNA? What's your recipe? So, so it's so critical that people stay true to who they are. And so we have to just try to outline, you know, what, you know, and, and to everyone understands what and define what we do and what we are. And we engineer from the ground up pretty much everything. So, uh, you know, you know, transducers, that's, that's definitely my specialty. Um, mm -hmm. like, like I, I, I started a, a company called Aura Sound. You guys remember the Aura Bass Shaker? Yeah, uh, that, 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 well. that was my that was all that was my patents and all really? the stuff I did. Yeah, and it was it was the moving magnet transducer with uh, with flexors inside. So I took some old school suspension te technology that were from like the fifties, and realized that was the best method to do a, a use as a moving magnet. And uh, it was a dual gap push pull design, really, really, you know, for its time, it was really cool. And it it wasn't designed for. It was designed for actually Douglas Trumbull, 
he did an entertainment ride at the Luxor Hotel, and he wanted localized effects and you know floor effects. So he he mixed a, his own like LFE channel essentially before back then for those shakers, so he could enable them and comp. And that's where it all that's really started. But that was at Aura Systems, was called the time, and that product led to the beginning of the Aura Sound brand. And oh. I, you know, I also developed the the radio magnet technology. I don't know if people know what that is. Uh, people who know Aura Sound would know what that is, but that's just taking the magnetic field instead of being a donut style with the north and the south pole. The north pole's on the inside, south pole's on the outside, so it's radially. But you can only do that with high energy products. And there is some significant distortion reduction by doing that, um, and and whatnot. So, and you can do well. That all started the underhung designs. Mm, so we had a yeah. magnet, yeah. a gap height that was say two inches tall with a quarter inch coil. You have perfect linearity throughout this excursion. And yeah. an eight inch sub we did for a commercial Pro Sound back then. It but keeps it a was, constant magnetic field. Through. Yep. Yeah. The whole, the, all of all of the voice coil is energized by the same gap, the g same amount of Gauss. So it's yeah. it's a perfectly linear. It's like a flat uh, BL curve. They call it. I just have to say for because um, we've been reviewing your products for a number of years, including the first Speedwoofer and then the Speedwoofer 10s and then the Mark II. Yeah. The fact that you could put a driver of this magnitude in such a budget product with the cast basket, with the vented pole piece, and what is it like a two or two and a half inch voice two call? And I mean, well, two and a half. So, I think I mean, on the Mark II, I can't. I, I'm not even thinking of the twelve. Sorry, what you have on the screen is our twelve. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. uh, just to say, just that ten inch driver is just yeah, yeah. really well designed and high build quality for such a yeah. low asking price. Yeah, you were raving about that earlier, Gene. Yeah, yeah. that goes. That, that just goes to the the uh, the recipe for our company because, like what Howard elaborated early on is the content we put in is on a bill of material standpoint is much greater percentage and uh than you would on someone who has to have a distributor or dealer margin necessarily so that I guess helps. that's that's another difference is that a lot of companies will say okay we have to come out with a uh 299 bookshelf speaker here's what it contains we we rather say hey we've got to come out with a good bookshelf speaker um Here's what it needs to contain uh, to be good, and then we'll price it afterwards. A little yeah. different, yeah. And the thing is, and if it means like you know what, we really need, we want, we want to hold this price point, we'll make less margin. I mean, it's our call. We're a, this is a family-run business. We don't have a corporation. We don't have anything to say. We can't do that. If we make, if we make that, it's because we're in it for the long picture, the long game. You know, it's not a matter of oh, I want to make short-term high-margin gains. Like right now, there's, you know, I don't want to, the, the, the politics of inflation yeah. um, is really frustrating because we know firsthand the margins that companies have increased their pricing to. And I don't know if you remember, but our speed woofer in 2016 for the analog version that it was, was 399 Up until a little over a year ago, ours was 399 still. We had to raise it to four twenty eight seventy one, I think it was, mm -hmm. and that's literally because we calculated the amount of the shipping, the uh, transient characteristic of the shipping cost increase, uh, as a pass through, and we said, hey, should shipping come down back to where where it is, we'll take that out. Well, what we did instead, we actually made the product, we made it our next generation even better. So we'll always say if if we uh, can make it for less or sell it for less, we will because, again, this is a value proposition. We want to get audio in the hands as many in as, in as many people's hands as possible. The whole this we draw this. It's so rewarding to hear people like that letter Howard read or hear people talk about um, their experience. And they what's great is having the direct uh, feedback. We hear it all the time. And uh, it, it's just so rewarding. It's what keeps drives us to, to have well, that. And, I, and Don and I have noticed this over the last year with the supply chain issues and inflation. Some of the, some of the loudspeaker companies, I understand they have to raise their costs, but yeah. we're looking at some speakers that are not internet mm -hmm. direct, but everybody's pretty mm -hmm. much selling online anyways. Yeah. But we're looking yeah, at yeah. some brands that have almost doubled the retail of their products.
tax. And it, you know, it's not, that's, I hate to say it, that's not proportional to actual what's going on in the cost. Yeah. It's not. I, it, but so it's an opportunity. Maybe they, they have to offset for how long they ran without being, doing that. Now they have to catch up. But are they going to bring the price down when it, when everything starts to settle down? Maybe in a year. That almost or two never years? happens in life. Like I know, company. exactly. Yeah. I know. And that's what's if the government gets more power, it never <laughs> takes it away afterwards. It's a similar but kind did of you thing. just say that, Gene? <gasps> yeah. yeah. Sure. <laughs> Wow. Okay, yeah, so liberal, but we won't get into. So that. what we're showing right now is this is some of the I call it the the DNA check is 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 a, is just a key thing. There's a, a process. Any engineer guys out there will understand that there's a process, and there's there goes from concept to finished goods. And when you have that, there's there's key steps and checkpoints along the way. Uh, and so we call it a RSL DNA check, where we say, okay. At each at these key phases, milestones, does it align with RSL's DNA? And honestly, in performance, value, everything has to be confirmed. And we can build a, a great one-off prototype and go, oh, this is awesome. And then, okay, have manufacturing do it. No, 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 it doesn't work like that. <laughs> you have to cradle the grave. We have to see it through and make sure at every phase from called the design validation phase to the uh, engineering validation to production validation. Again, all that's happening at those phases are larger scale quantities of the prototype that allow you to get the confidence that, okay, this could be done at scale and, and be produced. And this is some of the discipline process that I have brought to RSL. And it's paying off because we control a lot uh, um, of the process with our manufacturing. So we spent a lot of time doing the structure to make sure our manufacturing are following our manufacturing partners are following the guidelines. You know, we've invested a lot in with our manufacturing partners to where we have exclusive, you know, uh, processes and proprietary uh, testing techniques. And so we qualify our products, you know, in a very disciplined structured way. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, for a small company, it, you know, like that, is it really important? Yeah, I've heard, you know, and I, and I go, yeah, because the only way we're going to just, have this recipe grow is to have this at the core of uh, of our best practices to say so we use all I, so i was like in this next slide you're at the r d so obviously this is this is my love and you've got uh, a lot of test gear i didn't realize you guys have an audio precision clear yeah. clip well, damn well, so so we i i was their early adopter on clipple um wolfgang and udo clipple I've known for many, 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 many years, the turn of the, the 2000s, early 2000s. And, um, and there was a lot of stuff that, we, that I've done and with it and, and the evolution of what, uh, what Clipple is. It is so amazing to see. I thought, you know, how can a test equipment company that's specific for loudspeakers, you know, survive? But with the advent of audio and so many variations and Lexas and headphones and you name it, it's, it's the, it's a preeminent, uh, test system. So, uh, we have to qualify. And those, those four graphs are the fundamental priorities of, uh, of, uh, transducer, uh, when you're mm -hmm. looking for a, su a subwoofer, uh, the driver and also in the box, the behavior, but, that that when he talked about the BL curve, that red line in the upper left of the clipple section, so that's a BL curve. What that means is BL is the force factor, and then so as this voice coil moves in and out, it has a force, and it can move so far before it starts to drop off because the co uh, percentage of the coil starts going out of the gap. So that's yeah. just fundamental, the, sim the simple side of it. And then the blue curve is the KMS, that's the inverse of the stiffness, so it's softest at the valley. So you try to align the stiffness to match the force so you get a transducer that behaves very linearly because this is really hard to describe, but if you have a system that is not balanced between suspension and force or in, in, in a system, what happens is you develop what is, is, is like a bias, uh, meaning subwoofers playing a lot for like a few minutes and, and getting warm and getting hot. Well, the voice girl starts to just start, instead of being in center, it's moving back and forth along the center point of the suspension. It actually starts to bias outwards and the virtual center becomes further out. Mm. And so you have things like a voice code or woofer could jump out of the gap 
or and it could seize or it starts rocking because it's not biased and suspension is is tilting and it rocks and it starts scraping and it shorts out and burns out a coil burns out an amp or does whatever so there's or so you many get mechanical artists. noise right over time yes yes and that yeah. becomes when you start hearing mechanical noise that can be problematic but the one that's very telling on this driver that is the light green lower left one that is uh the inductance uh, so essentially over current so the li it's Beautiful. very very linear the deviation yeah. across its movement in and out is very linear and that can only be done with the optimization and geometry of what they call shorting rings you know mm -hmm. eddy reduce the eddy currents in the back emf and linearizing that so and the advantage of, of that is you have a band you have a subwoofer now that has a wide bandwidth because you yes can get yes yeah you can, you can have a 19 inch woofer that can really have with a 25 hertz resonance and also produce 100 hertz as good as a 10 inch woofer if you do it right yeah <laughs> Just you know, out of what's most impressive is your flux capacitor readings. Those are amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, point two well, gigawatts. <laughs> well, the, you know what's funny is it's just very. All these things tell a story, but and I can go on and on, but I just want to make sure that people, you know, I realized and I realized quickly that people don't have an idea of what we do as a small company. Maybe they think we just buy and turn. No, no, it's far from it. We are. Yeah. This is we eat. Like I said, eat, breathe, sleep, sleep, everything about this. So, what's um, uh, just out of curiosity, what is the inductance of that driver? Because I can't read the graph. It's one, I think it's about uh, one millihenry. Wow. One, that's, yeah. I know for, for how tall a coil is and how many turns are that's, in there. That yeah. takes some doing. Yeah. That really yeah. does. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. I've seen some companies use basically what amounts to like a car audio driver in a box and they start rolling off at 60 Hertz because of the inductance. Yes. And because, you know, maybe they have super high excursion. I'll look at the X max rating or look at the surround. It has this, you know, super crazy tall roll. Well, that's good for allowing excursion, but is it linear? Does yeah. it, is it balanced? Is it, you know, <laughs> so, 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 so just so people know there, there's some people complaining they can't read the graphs. I'm going to put this slide presentation on our on our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audioholics. If you're a patron, you could definitely download it and follow along because uh, it is hard to read this. I know you're trying to put a lot of data into these slides yeah, and fit it, yeah. fit it in, but you know, you're going over it. So that's, that's good. Um, yeah, yeah. Let's so, here now. okay. So this is, uh, you know, I always, with engineering, one of the things you learn early on is like in, in a big, bigger company, oftentimes you, you design something and manufacturing engineer takes it on and and moves and takes it and carries the ball and runs with it and builds it. Well, I've been in situations where two years later after a build that we're still building the same product and we get one of our, through a dealer, one of our customers comes back and says, hey, this is pre or maybe in my hiatus from RSL. Hey, this doesn't perform. I had to replace my right speaker and it sounds completely different. I go, what are you talking about? It's the same speaker. So <laughs> to take it back to the lab, we measurement and it has changed and drifted so much from where it was started uh, mm -hmm. that it's so frustrating because to, to have a speaker that you design, you spent blood, sweat and tears getting it right. And it's only to be built inconsistently and not be monitored or supervised or checked to make sure that ongoing production is police to control because when when like you hear tesla talk about production hell well it's because the stringent ca aspects that they have to control a lesser quality or a company would have to say would it would let okay yeah that's that's close enough let's see well no we have this, this these in place to be able to manufacture consistently and repeatedly so the user experience is is predictable you know when we talk on the phone we say hey I'm not hearing this or I'm hearing this particular thing. And I go, Hmm, that's interesting. And so, and we go through it, but you know, that, so I had to part of the whole uh, holistic process you have to have, and the en design engineers have to have the touch points and really have to be able to carry the ball all the way through and know that there's tolerance settings and testing in place that assures consistent production. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I was like the earliest adopters of Clipple QC, uh, which is a really nice scenario because what like, oh, it's a little sidebar, but Clipple QC, or it might be called something different now, but um, I, I refer to it as that. It, it allows you to take like a, a measurement 
in like a couple seconds on a production line. And it has the analytical wherewithal to be able to say, oh, um, that the speaker and in the post process, you can you can uh, sort it, meaning you can sort it from a, a plus or minus three dB standpoint down to a plus or minus 0.5 dB standpoint. So you can match, pair, do all these crazy things that we just dreamed of. I dreamed of back in the day, but now it's real and it's happening and, and we're in, implementing these things in place. So. So that's an important that's an important point because um, many times we've measured budget speakers and from the big brands, from the guys that have the R and D chops, yeah. you measure the left speaker, you measure the right speaker, and the impedance is not the same. The resonant yeah, points cool. at below tuning are different. Yeah. Um, the crossover, the tolerance that they're using on the parts is probably not tight enough. Correct. And if you don't get a good match between your left and right speakers, how are you going to get good imaging when you set them up as a stereo <laughs> pair? Exactly. So the tolerance and that we have to impose, I mean, everything we do, there has to be, I, there's a purpose for everything, you know, and if you're going to go to the, the length of making a crossover, specifying components, it's the difference between uh, the common 20% or NPE or a, a poly 1%. You know, it's not huge difference because what it comes down to at that capacitor supplier is the sorting. They do the yeah. testing and the sorting. That's all it is. It's the same part. It's just yep. filtered. So it's it's it doesn't cost any material difference. It's just sorted and printed. So I always try to drive. And that's why we literally worked with a capacitor company. And our, our speakers have our own capacitors with our own specified film that we use and specified tolerance. And, you know, it's just part of the recipe for success. So, okay, well, you spoiled the, the transition, Gene. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Go, new product, new product, because people are asking, where's the new product? <laughs> this is one new product right here. This is very interesting to me, um, and especially Don as an integrator. Yeah. Don, maybe you could, we talked about this briefly before, but maybe you want to – try to explain i think what you explained before was great a great way to explain it to our audience maybe uh, what, about about integrate lc i mean i'm like so this this compact speaker with the right. dual woofers with tweeter together it doesn't have a lot of the drawbacks that common center channel mtms uh, are cited to have but it, what's better than that this is this baffles angled so the orientation shown in the picture is as if it's a center channel that might be above the tv it's an in wall below no, no. Right now, the orientation is as if it was above the TV. Oh. The baffles, the baffles angled downwards. Oh, gotcha. And it's, still, it's still within like uh, three and three quarters inch depth, but the baffles angled about fifteen degrees to give you uh, the a directivity or directionality, I should say, that you typically need to have, especially for vocal and localizing. And, and, right, and because that. in real world installations, you just can't always place uh, speakers ideally. And so many people want to follow the spec that Dolby puts out. And a lot of that comes from movie theaters. You just, and, and most, a lot of applications, you just can't do that. So the flexibility of being able to angle that speaker to accommodate for these deviances in that is, is fantastic. Um, and so many people, would you say that you've heard a lot of prejudice against architectural audio not being up to par to traditional speakers? Yeah, that, and that's, that's a bad rap. You know, I totally I know it's it's so what you guys what the architectural side does. I mean, the, I've seen go to great lengths to do customized enclosures, the damping material, you know, stuff. You fix the room acoustics as part of your equation, tip oftentimes. So, and that's more important than anything in some cases, you know. So, well, yeah, I so. tell you, looking at the crossovers, I haven't heard these yet, and I hope to change that in the near future. But just looking at the quality of the crossover components on that is exponentially better. Then and I hate to say it, a lot of much more expensive speakers that we sell. I yeah. can't believe that two hundred dollars each. I mean, that's. I mean that that's a. Yeah. Like you, yeah. you when you've been in the business as long as I have, you can kind of look at a speaker and go, "Damn, that's a well-made product." Um, yeah. and and I'm I'm impressed. I mean, again, I can't. Um, yeah, I mean, you. Yeah. I, we're all about proof is in the pudding, and that's why we right. have our trial period and all this stuff. The one the one thing we have is um, we we sell direct and. Um, and we have a complimentary product called the C34E uh, Mark II that we introduced in February of this year. And we introduced it. We, we added some features like uh, the attenuation, uh, the exposed dome tweeter, uh, 
you know, just, and it really, it really, uh, it, it, it's an Atmos solution. And we see um, for overhead. And now what this, this was a derived from our customer feedback to say, oh, I love your ceiling speakers are great Atmos. Do you have an in-wall, a regular in-wall speaker that's complimentary to it? And we couldn't just do a regular in-wall because the difference is most, a lot of, first of all, I'm going to jump around a little bit. The in-ceiling speakers, they often have, I'll call it a car audio type of speaker where the tweeter's coaxially mounted. Correct. And inherently, that cone propagates the sound out and it radiates and reflects off of that tweeter in front of it. And the coherence and the, the, the relative position and phase, they're not on the same plane. So you have inherent response anomalies that you try have to use a uh, crossover components to try to compensate or do something off oftentimes I mean, i'm speaking these are generalities so well, not to and say the mechanical that. time alignment's not correct on that either exactly so this is on the same baffle this this is on yeah. the same baffle angled on the same plane and with some horn loading for the tweeter for the low end so it blends with the mids uh, uh like we designed in and um and what's cool about it is it rotates so the left speaker the tweeter is on mm -hmm. the outside on the left a right center channel it's as you see here or if it's below your tv it can uh, go upside down with a, uh, it where the tweeter, the baffles pointing up at the listener on the right side uh the tweeters on the outside there because it's angled in so now you've got a system where it's 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 pitched inward without having to have like if you've seen like you've probably done this don the, the in ceiling speakers where they have the recessed box and do some really cool uh, built-in ceiling speakers that are sure. directional and really provide a great sound mm -hmm. well this is the same it's it's a conventional in wall and so, so Drew, can we talk about this just for a second because yeah. you know one of my personal goals here being part of the audioholics team is to shed a light on integrators and, and yeah. architectural products right so there's this huge prejudice or wives tale that architectural products don't sound as good and that may that may have been true seven eight ten years ago but really if you start off from the ground up designing an architectural yeah. infinite baffle system with that in mind, understanding that you have to do with drywall and studs and, and the quality level is this there. I mean, listen, the majority of what we do are sound bars or in walls or in ceilings. We're able to put together some really amazing sound systems um, that are, that are hidden. And, and a lot of your clients and, 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 and my clients that the, the wife acceptance factor, or just, they don't want to look at big speakers. That's just the market now. And being able to have a true audiophile hi-fi product that is able to, to be hidden is achievable now. And and, and, and I think your product's going to be one of those. And affordable. So I remember and this. And affordable, yeah. So, and one of the things that we're talking about doing, we get, we get so many calls. Like I was just, uh, maybe a couple days ago, we had someone saying, listen, I, I, I'm calling you guys because I have too many customers asking me, uh, to be able to get to install your products. I can't ignore you guys anymore. Do you have, do you have any dealers <laughs> set up? And I said, we're not structured out that way. However, we're considering a simple referral type of program where we can, if you, if you have desire for the speakers, we can do it and direct drop ship or just lots of things. We haven't worked that out yet. You know how we want to really well, go about that. Right. But the architectural side is hard to reach because so many uh, people who buy the speakers, you know, these speakers, they're DIY. They're doing installing themselves. So we're not reaching as many people that could really benefit from yeah, the bulk of the market doesn't want to install this. That's why yes, exactly. I'm able to feed my family for all these yeah. years. <laughs> well, and listen, and it's not necessarily easy. Uh, don't people yeah, don't yeah. want to break out drywall saws and measure and, <laughs> and have stud detectors. I'm serious. You should do that because if yeah. you make this excellent, affordable product, you know, that venue, and it's not just a money thing. It's being able to, have re your re products customers. accessible to more people that yeah. just don't want to do it themselves. And I mean, that's a real thing. One, one of the reasons why I feel that architectural speakers can do a really great job with home theater um, is that the, in the old days of, of stereo, the ideal situation would be some speakers that were away from the wall so that you'd give them the opportunity to image better instead of being right at the wall. Obviously, with architectural speakers, they're in the wall, against the wall, so you don't have that. But on the other hand, when you're dealing with a surround system, you've got speakers in the back and maybe in the ceiling adding 
ambience to the overall um, sound, pulling mm -hmm. the image out of the front, actually, and placing it in the room around you. And I think that that really makes up for it and, and is a reason why uh, uh, an architectural home, uh, architectural speaker based home theater system can sound very good. That's just my opinion. Yeah. And you also, you also kind of mitigate the SBIR effects yeah. of having that speaker right. out in the room now. Right. You don't, have, you, you don't, have, yeah, that it's so gone, but yeah, it, it, you know, there's a debate on, on the sonic, uh, how do you say, you know, we've, I've, I've listened to it many times compared, listen, you know, we, we wanted, to, we were coming out with this, the first, the idea of maybe how do we promote this as like the first, a bookshelf audiophile speaker that's like a bookshelf speaker or something like that that's in a wall because every like you said don everyone thinks that an in wall is is often has it sacrifices something well it, it really doesn't if you do it right so correct so and no, i appreciate I, I, you saying that that's that's been a big um deal for me to try to and a lot of people like to argue with that and yeah there's just a lot of scenarios and situations especially for surround side surrounds um, you know, effects surrounds okay. in the ceiling for Atmos, or, or you're against a back wall. A lot of times people have to place yeah, you want, real close yeah. to a back wall. Yep. Yep. Now you've got six, eight, 10 inches of speaker hanging off that. It just makes it difficult. Well, yeah, think, about, think about this uh, sofa against the wall or uh, just a buffet table, you know, uh, bordering the wall. Now with the rear speakers and the baffles angled inward, mm -hmm. you can get that directionality that and the cues and the ambience that you need with where it's all integrated and it's left and right rear. So the orientation is as you are these need. fixed with the frame, the fixed yeah. angle. Or is yeah. We, the, 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 uh, I've, there's some, there's stuff out there that has some ratcheting, you know, things yeah. like clean and but they're huge. huge sacrifice. And, they're huge, and the cal and the, the cal uh, caliber of the stuff to, to offset the cost, to have the ratcheting mechanism. It's like, it's not. It's, so we decided early on, we know this, this, this can work with our in ceiling speakers or success of that. And we did, carried it over and developed this to be for in walls. So, you could potentially it, use this as an in ceiling speaker too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no doubt. I mean, yeah. no doubt. There's no reason. Yeah. And what we've done is too. We've also we're introducing. It's not well official yet, but we're, is we're making a square a square grill for our round speakers for people who want don't want to see the round. Right. That's a big deal because you yeah. want to match up because the trend on can lights now and lighting is to go with square. So having <laughs> having the ability to do both round or squares, it's a big deal in my world. Aesthetically, yeah. yeah, yeah. Interesting. yeah. And we Drew, a lot uh, of what's the sensitivity? Of those these are five and a quarter inch drivers or fours? <laughs> yeah, dual five and a quarters on this one. And uh, off the top of my head, I want to say it's uh, eighty nine ninety dB. See, that's sensitivity. the advantage of having the two drivers. Is two it drive, the two five and a quarter larger area? Yeah. And yeah. and it's uh, it's legit. We you know we go through all of the test and measurement qualifications on it. So, so these, so, these kind of timbre match and are, yep, are yeah. So your, they, they're they're your matched to, to our sound <clears> signature, <throat> and that matches with our regular bookshelf uh, speakers and some other ones. And like the next one, go to the next slide, Gene. Yeah, uh, I think this one, this is this is one of our better uh, well, better selling speakers because it's the it's the do all speaker. What I mean by that, it's small enough to be have a good, uh, well, I guess spouse acceptance factor, I should say. Um, and, and that can mount on a wall, mount wherever book and be, be out of the way and not be obtrusive. And the $99 center center, really, that's where, <laughs> that's, awesome. CG, that's where the thing is. What's unique about this, this is CG. We've had the CG three out for several years now. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we offer it in a really hand, uh, you know, seven coats or eight coats of, of polyurethane coating, uh, clear coat, piano finish, and gloss white and gloss back. And that finish is getting more and more and more prohibitively expensive because of suppliers that can do that. And our manufacturing mm -hmm. partners don't uh, have had to increase the price because of that to us. And it was at that time early on, we said, you know, complimentary to this, you know, we, this finish is every bit as nice and, and elegant and it's actually very neutral because it's like a textured matte finish. So it's not, it's not going to reflect any light or LEDs during the, when I'm watching a dark movie, it's not going to do any of that. Um, and it's a, it's a nice, really easy way to integrate uh, a nice, elegant solution. 
and it has its solid build. There's uh, a compression guide tuning and bracing inside. There's all everything that makes up our CG3 speaker that's been around. And we now we came up with these and at the same time with some crossover adjustments and some uh, uh, magnet adjustments, we've been able to gain some sensitivity uh, gains on these on these on this family of speakers. And nice. paired up with paired up with uh, the Speedwoofer, it's a it's a home run. So if you have a very entry level, not entry level, it's it's really a, a, a hi-fi, but it's affordable hi-fi. So uh, and it's, it's so it's, much terminology in our industry. It's like a minefield. Yeah. You know what I, I mean? Know. You come out, you try to come out with a great value in a speaker, and people immediately, some people would dismiss it because of the price when I yeah. don't take the time to look into it. I know. You know what's funny though? I'm seeing people more and more uh, recognize um, value because I, I hate to, your channel, Gene, here, Audioholics, mm -hmm. and many others, they, there are, there are mouth. We do not do, much advertising you know we do some yeah. with some partners but it's it's really word of mouth and because we'd rather grow grassroots than 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 spend a bunch of dollars on marketing uh, versus putting in the content of the product you know we'd rather do that if we can so we're content growing steadily you know we're, we don't we don't we don't have this corporate war chest or you know public tr uh, stock <laughs> to keep up or anything like that so you know drew you said something you were telling about the story and history of the company. There was an Sorry, I lost my mic, so I had to get back. There was an architectural speaker company a few years ago that came out with a marketing campaign. They're like, we don't have a story. We just make great speakers, right? But I love the story. I think people, when we buy a product, they love the story. They want to hear the history. They want to know they're buying a legacy. They want to yeah. know they're buying trickle-down technology, not just a company that bought a name like yeah, so many yeah. companies have in the past and just was a totally different business, but that direct tie legacy to hi-fi i think that's very cool i just want to note that out yeah so this that. is the big billy baru right here for any <laughs> Caddyshack fans any of you caddyshack fans this is yeah, what everybody's been really asking about when are you going to have a bigger yeah. sub we yeah. love the speed woofer 10s it's a kick-ass product i think it dances between right close to our large room rating if you get two of them especially yeah baseaholic yeah. i'm talking about but we want something that's more donimus level yeah, you know, Don Dunn is all about that base. <laughs> all about so, that base. So a lot of uh, what this is, is uh, it's several years in development. And a lot of our RSL customers will know that because we constantly get emails saying, hey, is a 12, when's the 12 coming? When's the 12 coming? When's the 12 coming? Well, it's coming now and we have a date on it. It's uh, January uh, 2023. Um, it is... Um, legitimately with no boost uh, or eq or extension or boost or eq uh down 16 hertz 3 db down and a coax there's no room gain as part of the response that graph is the actual response and the one thing gene i i, I touched on when I, I talked before when uh, when you had questions on the, the 10s i think it was or james mm -hmm. you guys do outdoor ground plane you go outside and there's a technique i don't know if much of the users know or listeners know called a microphone in the box technique mm -hmm. and rew actually has mic in box uh function uh, post-processing function built as part of it i don't use rew i use a system from audiomatica called clio for a lot for this particular test but there's a paper that i back in my garage i was in redondo beach probably Oh, 30 years ago, 25, 30 years ago, um, where there's a paper that uh, a good friend of mine and I recreated from uh, Richard Small's paper on, you know, if you can do an RC time constant or have a filter that can correct for the resonance quality of the cabinet, then you can have, you can legitimately measure anechoic uh, performance with a microphone in the box. And Traditionally, people are doing near field measurements, and when you a sealed box, you do a near field measurement, you can get it with you know within like a centimeter or less. Yeah. You, know, you can get a truly accurate measurement that's anechoic, shape wise, not magnitude. You can scale and do all those things, but shape wise, you get an accurate characterization. Well, when you when you start adding a port or passive radiators, you have to 
make sure you're mathematically summing those properly for their area and for their proximity and how they blend together. And that's, it's really hard to get an accurate, consistent result. Well, with a microphone in a box technique, you can get an accurate anechoic result, uh, but you have to make sure the microphone is centered. And actually, let me see, I have this right to my left. So this oh, must be new to REW because I haven't, I haven't heard about I this. It, so I don't know if you can see this. So see this microphone? I don't know if you can see it. So mm -hmm. this, this, is, this is to reach, I, we have different lengths of microphone. This is a calibrated reference mic to associate with Cleo. This reaches inside the 12 inch box to find, you wanna find the average pressure zone, you know, where it's somewhere in the center. You get close to the edge, the pressures are higher. You get to the center, it's more average uh, and it's what you want. And if you can reach, get position that point, you can get that. It's hard to maybe if you can zoom in on that curve, Gene, maybe. That, yeah, let me that try. Tape. Yeah. Um, yeah, this doesn't zoom any. Unfortunately. Yeah, sorry. Well, it's a, it's a good. Well, what that is, that, that's an actual measurement, and it's super clean. You see, super smooth, and very classical. And and ground plane measurements can do that, but to get that, that what we sacrifice here is we have to drill a hole in the cabinet. Well, if I do it in the bottom and the center, drill a hole, have it come up, or in the back where it doesn't interfere with anything, uh, and plug it up. You know, okay, now, you know, not everyone's going to do that, but you can if you wanted to rather than trying to haul a rig out to a uh, a field. Oh, you should you're opening a Pandora's box now cuz James Larson if he hears this he's going to be drilling holes in your stub. There we go. Oh, he know I, I, I'm sure he knows about it, but he's, he's probably he he probably has it. When you ever you you adopt something yeah. and you, you your database is built on something <laughs> to change the methodology is like throwing a wrench into it. Well, so, you don't want to destroy a product either. So yeah, he's, I know he's that's very... the thing is. I know that. So we 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 would let him do it if he wants to do it that way. <laughs> he can drill a hole in it, or, or we'll send him one with the hole drilled in it. That's but hilarious. A substantial cabinet on that too. It's huge. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's unapologetically well. big, right? Yeah. 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 I, we like to say unapologetically awesome, preferred because we've heard. Oh, it. okay. <laughs> so when you but, come out when you're 18, I well, I should show you something that's behind me, but it's okay. okay. I'll do it another time. I don't think but, you can lift it, Drew. <laughs> oh, is that a challenge, Howard? Oh, Drew could lift that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, regardless, I'm going to get into that. But what I can say is the size is, is actually on par. We, we just, uh, we, of course, competitive analysis. We know where we stand. You know, we're probably the same volume as a lot of our competitors out there at this size uh, for a 12 inch. Yeah. And uh, it's got true 500 watt RMS. And you got to realize we match the power for the output and the capability. Everything's, I use the term symbiotic, meaning the woofer is designed to match with the enclosure of volume, power, price. Everything goes into it, and we just try to maximize that, like I said, that point of diminishing returns. So um, so that's, you know, that's where this one's at. But the one thing I think I mentioned earlier to you is... I'm going to say this, and it's, it's going to be controversial, but the idea of port plugs just chaps my hide. I, I, I don't understand <laughs> no how no port time. plugs, how can it be endorsed, allowed? I mean, I, you know, if I'm talking a pure standpoint, especially from the audiophile side, because imagine when you design a system like we're talking about, you have components of the system, and the components of the system align a certain way. And if you have a target, you design to a target. Mm -hmm. If you're saying, well, I'm going to take that target and I'm going to plug up the, the suspension aspect or the acoustic aspect or affect it and try to think it's going to perform optimally, you're fooling yourself because with a port plug, you're, you're saying, okay, it's going to work in both. Well, that means you're not working in any one thing optimally. optimally. Yeah. So, I mean, that's just my little pet peeve. I, I had to get out there. I guess unless they have different tuning, if, if there's a tuning mode you could switch to if you go to sealed. Well, so DSP. that's that, right there with DSP. That means you're fo forcing or imposing it. And the only way to do that correctly is through a sensory or a current driven or a servo driven system. Then you can impose uh, the B a Q, uh, you know, you could, you could actually impose the Q on the driver that you want or the resonance quality. But if you don't, have a current mode or a servo driven type of scenario, it will not perform. Now it'll still work and most people won't necessarily notice it, but it's not optimal. So I don't want people to fool themselves that it's, that it was, it's optimal. So, so I don't know. That's, I gotcha. that's just my, uh, 
I had to get that out of my chest. The other thing, um, personal um, pet peeve of mine is some companies with subwoofers um, advertise an RMS rating that doesn't turn out to be true. Yes. All the yeah, time. It is, it's, it's, it's crazy because, you know, of course, with all the competitive stuff we do, we have to see that. And Is your uh, amp class D or is it linear? It's a class D. This, is it this a is, uh, SMPS or is it a linear power supply? It's, a, it's, a, it's an SMPS. And so what we've done, we actually just went through an upheaval of power supply a little while ago to ensure <laughs> the, uh, the reliability. I mean, because one of the things we ha you have to do in this situation is you have to, you have to uh, be overkill. Heat is your enemy. Yeah. You have to make sure that you have way above the, min uh, the minimum, uh, what, what, the, what the book says you should have for an amount of heat sink or the temperature rise. It doesn't matter. This is an this is an enclosure. You need to have that temperature uh, accounted for and and design accordingly. And so, uh, we, you know, so we spent a lot of time on that. So it's a Drew. Good you know, have you noticed how some of the budget, so a lot of the subwoofers, the way they mount their amp, their plate amplifiers, and and DSPs to the back is lacking. Yeah. It's not a yeah. thought deal, and it's not. Yeah. So what I've seen is like, like you screw one down, and it, it bends the plate maybe, or yeah. there's only four screws and it bows out. Well, we have 10 screws around the perimeter on this one. We have, and I think 16 screws. We're making sure that it's solid and secure. And you're aware of that though. Yeah. Yeah. And we're introducing a, something to actually, uh, we're going to probably get some, I go after some, I, a, a patent on, but it's to actually address that specific thing you talk about, which which I can't share with you right now, but of course. in the near future we will. Well, the one reason why I ask is uh, Don and I have spoken about this many times. I think I probably ranted in one of our live streams. <laughs> Out of all the components in, in consumer audio, the least reliable component is the Double plate for amplifiers. The plate amplifier. Yep. They yep. freaking die. It doesn't matter the yep. brand. I've had the high-end yep. brands, the cheap yep. brands. I've had gremlins with plate amplifiers yeah. and Don yes. has had it, similar stories. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's a given. I mean, it's a notor it's notorious and we, every time we, you know, do, if there's something we can do and behind the scenes, you know, there's refinements, refinements that we do all the time to improve this, but you got to realize what's happening. We, that we've seen and what we can, with a, one of the core things is the sheer vibration, the vibrations that yeah. happen with mounting it there, mm -hmm. the microphonics, whatever you call that. These parts are not, meant to be able to handle that sure so literally the type of glue you use to hold down the parts on the board because that's what you have to do has to, it can't be too rigid and can't be too soft you got to have oh, the right okay. draw hardness you got to have the right yeah. temperature if it's you know you can't insulate thing you it's like be a really spring careful. a dampener well the, yeah then there's another aspect to it and that is if an amplifier fails wh what does the customer have to go through to get it uh back Bingo. up and running Bingo. And so one, one of the things that we do is that if in the unlikely event there's an amplifier failure, we have a, a quick disconnect plug on the amplifier. So you don't have to pull the woofer out. You don't. All you have to do is just take <clears throat> the screws around the perimeter of the amp. It pops out. Take, unplug it. Plug the new one in, and you're back in business. Because who nice. wants to send a heavy-duty subwoofer? halfway oh, around yeah. the country or halfway around the world just to get it fixed and, yeah. and to wait. It's got to be served now by shipping. the consumer. Yeah. Yeah. Now that's brilliant because, you know, we don't mean to nitpick, but these are things that Gene and I, I see all the time because of course you know, I, I, we sell hundreds of subwoofers every year, literally. And you know, that ability to service them or, or if you take the screws out, then you go to put it back in, it, you've stripped right. them or, you know, there's yeah. the little things. It's the devil's in the details. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, what's good. the uh, warranty? Uh, cor correct me if I'm wrong. Is it three years on the electronics? So we haven't finalized what we're going to do because this is the this is a new breed of amplifiers that we. Oh, okay. So currently it's two years on the electronics and five years on the, the system, and we uh, we're, we talked about addressing that because one of the ways uh, one of the ways to do it is to is to improve that and give our customers peace of mind because what you say because yeah. of the what this goes these amps go through on the shock and vibration it's that's the it's the weakest point and we do everything to to avoid it but man i i want to add something to that regardless of what the warranty period is which 
I guess, uh, can be revised. When, when the warranty is up, uh, we don't look at people and say, hey, you're on your own. They're part of the RSL family. Um, they make it possible for us to stay in business. We're not going to take advantage of them. If, cool. if, if, if an amplifier is out, out of warranty, um, we're going to cut them a deal. We, we don't want to, we don't want to make money yeah. on their misery. That's awesome. I love yeah. that. Yeah. That, then, that really differentiates you guys from yeah, a lot of And we like, around. like, you know, from this, this is, I think, uh, the 10 U. you introduced the 10 U in 2011, 10, How 10. 10 and we have we maintain service parts we maintain everything for that we offer service to our customers should they have a fit of that we support it and we have parts from stuff back in my when i was here in the first go around the late 80s where people have asked hey i have this vintage part and they call us all the time i'm not soliciting that we can buy those parts from us because we we keep sure. a, only a handful but i'm just saying we do we're very friendly i mean you, t you tell us your problem we'll, we'll take care of you you, you so know that a cool experience I had recently in a different hobby I'm into had an yeah. electronic device die and I sent it back to the manufacturer, obviously out of warranty. And they're like, look, we can't really fix it, but they offered and I took them up to sell me uh, an eight hundred dollar product for three hundred fifty dollars. Yeah. That was the world to me. I'm like, thank you. That was really cool. Yeah, that's the way yeah. to do it. That that's yeah. absolutely I mean, the way to do it. Yeah, we do it. And one of the things that we just, to handle some of our growth, I don't know, it's, this is a subtle thing, but we introduced um, this route protection service on our orders that we're covering the cost of because, one of them, you know, you build a subwoofer, you design the packaging, you make sure you, this thing just is not going to get damaged. And I don't care between FedEx, UPS, any one of these companies, we're, it's going to get damaged. It's going to get drop kicked. It's going to, yeah, something's yeah. going to happen to it. And it's beyond our control, beyond anything we can do, and the customer is not happy. So what route is coming to be our partner on our shipping, uh, where that's included. And again, we cover it. A lot of companies charge for that. Lost, stolen, or damaged, we cover and mitigate that for our Why customers. don't you mention what route does? Yeah, and route, it, route it, they handle the calls. They have an app that when you get an order on the app, they get an email from that your order is shipping or and it gives you the status updates on the app and it tracks it. And then should you have a problem, just go to your app, submit the request. You can do it live chat or phone call or whatever you need to do. And they'll take care of it. They said, oh, send us a photo of the, the damage. Look at it. And they, they are our front end to help uh, anyone with this sort of damage. And it's really helped us because that time, it takes a lot of time for us to manage and contact our FedEx, contact someone, whomever, to get a claim submitted, get the process, get photos. Mm -hmm. and, and then they ask for, oh, I need a photo of the, the back corner packaging also. And then we go to the customer relay. Now the customer has a direct relationship for handling a claim, whether it's porch piracy or lost from it that they can't find. And they take and they are they have been a godsend for us because they have been very responsive as we grow it's to be able to handle that people who have situations it's it's very time consuming so they've really helped in that and we tell anyone if you have any problems you can always call us but they're your they're the front lines that can really help and solve the problem quickly very cool awesome right so on. last question on the 12s um yeah. the 6.99 introductory price i know a lot of your products have free shipping obviously this is a much heavier product <laughs> Yeah, What's I don't know if do that. Have you guys yeah, figured we're, that out? We're, we're, we're finalizing that right now because that's, like, we've introduced, yeah. just so you know, and, and by, within short, within a couple months, we'll have that ironed out. But we've done, you know, now the, the, re, there's, uh, the return, there'll probably be return shipping and there might be some flat. But I, again, don't hold me to any of this stuff. Yeah. This is just our introductory price and it will be introductory. <laughs> I have a yeah. feeling. Yeah, for sure. So what that's that means is, if you get in early, you're probably you know we don't we don't ever like to change prices or ever increase prices, but just this this is going to be a, a really a tight price point. But we we know that that's how we our speedwoofer when we did so so well is we said you know what yes we'll make a little more less margin, but uh, this is just a price point that is compelling. And that our customers can, we will, we'll try to hold. And so it's, and it's proven out. So we're taking that same 
logic and applying it to the big brother. Oh yeah, well the 10s is you know that thing is almost always out of stock because there's so much demand for it. <laughs> Actually, that's a good good thank. It's a good segue, Gene. So because on our website we just uh, announced. So what's happened is <clears throat> we we grow again organically, meaning we don't uh, whatever we sell we invest back in the company and we buy more products. We do this, and so that just that allows us to grow steadily. But we can't go out and suddenly buy 50 containers of this or do, you know, some crazy amount because that's just not our growth. And we're okay with growing steadily, but that means demand is exceeding that growth. So, so we're growing and every, each time our, our order and size and quantity is increasing, but it sells out. So um, we're our doing, is it next Wednesday? Uh, I think it is, is our pre-order. We have a countdown timer for that. Mm -hmm. And, the last six or five uh, releases, are, we've had <laughs> server problems because literally we, we had to make it fair to everyone because they're calling in. And so we had to have, a, hey, okay, this is, this is the availability of ordering data. It secures you a unit and the stock goes fast and they buy it and, uh, and it, it just goes through it. And we have to tell them do this, but we had it several times where our server literally crashed and, and, our phones went off the hook and we were like, pan like two hands. Oh, hold on a second. Try so because right. we're, and the thing is when you go to try to, this is, I mean, this is some backend stuff in our company, but we go into our servers, we go into the back end of the same servers to be able to try to do man man orders manually or something. Well, if the server's down from the front mm -hmm. side, it's also down on the back side for us. So we, <laughs> we were taking a manual or email us or, and we'll, we'll take orders, but whoever the inbox is and in the email first, we'll get those taken care of first. Mm -hmm. So, so just let people know it is next week and you go to our website. Uh, I think it's Wednesday of next week. Uh, well, so, send me the link. I'll put it in the okay. video description and okay. I'll also put it on the YouTube community tab. So we'll definitely, okay. uh, we'll get the news out. Um, I would imagine at some point you got to get one of these subs into James Larson's hand so you can yeah, definitely, measure it definitely. before it gets too cold. Cause it's, he's doing the yeah. outdoor stuff. Oh, so be thrilled to put Maybe that this is a perfect, there. perfect time. I'll send him one with a hole in it. <laughs> so, <laughs> pre-drilled for his place pre just tell me his, my, his capsule diameter or whatever and i'll i'll get it yeah i'll put you in touch okay. well guys that was awesome i appreciate the history lesson of rsl you've actually educated me a lot of what goes behind the scenes of of the company that i didn't really think about didn't know you guys put so much into the measurement aspects of things but also listening of course but yeah. Uh, Drew, man, you're just a fountain of knowledge. We got to have you back on and just talk tech. Yeah, on, just hang on out. You know? Yeah, I know. I, I the problem is I could do this all night. Yeah, well, <laughs> we got to have a couple bourbons and hang out and <laughs> sure. relax. Listen, for for this level, this price point, with this much research and this quality, I'm impressed. I got to tell you, straight up. Yeah. Yeah, we Don, we should definitely look at those new in walls. Um, yeah, we, we have, should. Let's yeah. check those out and let, me, and let us talk. I mean, if. And there, you know, because us, for us, it's a structure because, you know, we have we set a retail price and people buy direct from us. We don't want to step on toes or anything like that. Sure, but if there's a course. way we can figure out a way where you have customers requesting it, we can get you some. You can you can order it and and you can cover the cost to to get it installed or whatever. Sure, awesome. no, for sure. I mean, yeah. I just like to, I just like to hear them and see how they sound yeah. and how they install. I mean, I was looking at your connectors when we're online here. You know, just the the connectors of high the highest quality. You you're gonna yeah, buy all metal, uh, you know, fifteen eighteen hundred dollar a piece architectural speakers that have that same kind of connectors. I mean, seriously, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. Because the one thing I know, like a binding post, you know, trying to tighten one on and oh, that after, you, yeah, forget that. Yeah. You're not gonna do that, that. that. You're gonna get cussed <laughs> a lot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> trying yeah. to do a binding post when you're on top of a ladder. So, or, you but know, those are quality connectors. You don't see those yeah. in all architectural speakers especially yeah. at that price point do they take 14 gauge wire or is that too thick well, i sure. actually i, I think it's 12 on the diameter of the bunny post awesome though so, i've yeah. seen a lot of architectural speakers you have to put 16 or 18 gauge no. it's like dental floss <laughs> and <I'm Yeah>. <laughs> those cheap ones you use gene uh, yeah, yeah, yeah focal <laughs> best sounding wall since pink floyd there you oh. go right. uh, believe me we were trying so our ceiling speakers uh, our ceiling speaker we, you, you, if you look at our owner's manual, you know, and stuff like that, there's a lot of dry humor in it in the manual. Oh yeah, and, and on the packaging, 
uh, our ceiling speaker, I think our, I think our slogan is uh, a speaker you can look up to is our slogan. <laughs> you know what? I'm stealing the shit out of that. I'm just okay. telling you. Uh, okay. And um, we, we haven't come out with one we like for the in wall yet. We're getting close. There's a few. There we go. We got to have uh, Brandon on and do t- bourbon talk with in walls. Oh, we should. Dude. Absolutely. I'll, I'll cool lead dude. that. Dude. Cool dude. Uh, so I guess, you know, I always look at roadmaps of companies and, and Don and I are, are, Don brings this installer perspective to me that I didn't have before I met Don. And it, it really gives me a, a, it opens the whole world of audioholics. And he's got me thinking about, you know, passive sound bars, more active kind of monitors. Well, that look kind in your, in your master bedroom. I told you, I told you, cause you were a little hesitant. I'm like, just trust me on this one. And you, yeah. you walk in that room, you see nothing. You got in ceiling jail audio subs and, and a, a passive sound bar and in ceiling speakers. Yeah. That room rocks. So what, I, what I'm getting at, Drew, is I love this in wall that you guys have come out with. But there's there's walls in Florida that are because the houses are blocked. Exterior walls. Yeah. You have yeah. exterior walls in a master bedroom where you can't put an in wall. So an on wall could be unsightly. On-wall. So imagine a passive sound bar that you could still use the preamp or you still use your amplifier yeah. section yeah. put it all so in one I, form factor i i love that but let me ask you the um don is the integration of that it's it's a custom install if you if you if you're talking about doing something like that right it's not well, something I mean, well, and you... i mean listen if you're going to run main speakers you, if you're going to fish up your cables to your tv and your equipment's down low ah, which yes, is 90 yes. percent of what your clients yeah. have then that's not a big deal. I mean, yeah. you know, okay. you, there are some passive sound bars that will rock your world out there. You know, yeah. Leon Sonance makes some next level acoustics like you guys or, yeah. or even an LCR, a flat LCR where you just take that cabinet, make it taller and flatten it out using your same driver technology if possible. Yeah. You know, I that think... that's flexibility for your clients. Yeah. And the, the, the thing about it is, I mean, we size this to be narrower than the studs. You know, we had to make sure it fits all the orientation, of horizontal, vertical. Sure. The problem is, <laughs> if it's a center channel, it's got to be tricky because because of the studs are usually yeah, right. Right. Yeah, right. No, I, but so but you, you, you know how to get around that in a yeah, commercial sure. bed, but an average yeah. DIY guy it, it might have a little sure. trouble with that. Yeah. Or an on wall where you could do a combination yeah. of flush mounts and an on wall or three on no. walls. So, I mean, no, you're seeing that I trend think, now. Yeah, the idea of like backer boxes or an on wall backer box, you know, but yeah. you know, compromise some things, you know, maybe. So, but realize one of the things that people uh, I, I see is no matter what you do, these speakers need to be crossed over for the most part, you know, whether yeah. so have a, they should, they complement great from having a sub. And, and I've seen some great, like you, I, you mentioned the in ceiling sub, you know, conceptually, that's awesome getting the sub up base up high for some reason. Yeah, room. but it's a pain in the ass. Let me tell you something. I, I, <laughs> it's a, it's a major NASA level undertaking to, yeah, to yeah. do architectural subs, right? Sounds I like know. you may need a, a very small and compact sub that puts out a lot of base for a small size. All right. mm, that's something that's under the desk we can't see. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> hey, well, hey, not that. Oh, you're supposed to be coy, Howard. That's not no, on the road, back, that's right? not on the official roadmap, public roadmap. Yet. I didn't say anything. Okay. Say nothing at casual. Uh, the the NDA is kind of shaking a little bit. Yeah. So yeah, good for you, yeah. Howard. Well, guys, Howard, it's always a pleasure to talk to you, man. Um, Same here, Gene. I'm glad we're face to face after all the years of just chatting on email and phone and stuff. It's always good to see people face to face. Maybe one of these days when I go to California, I can go and visit your facility yeah, and, and or vice please. versa. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Oh, you got to come here. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you hang out with Don, there. man. It'll be a trip you'll never forget. Let me tell you. <laughs> I promise you. Never forget. <laughs> I look well, forward okay. to it. You got to tell me what time is it? What time of the year is it not humid in, in Florida? Um, From uh, the end of November to like May. OK. OK. So that's the time to go. Humid, oh, is yeah, it's humid is relative. Humid is relative. Yes, it is oh, relative humid humidity. Is relative. <laughs> Never breaks a hundred here. <laughs> yeah, I I lived in Arizona before, so oh yeah, it, it was a dry heat. Let's just are, say. Are you? Yeah, it's a dry heat. <laughs> it yeah. actually really is. Have you? Uh, are yeah. you in Southern California? Yeah, I'm in. We're all in Southern California. All right. Uh, we're all around the Thousand Oaks, Simi Valley, California. All right. On. I, California is beautiful. You know? Yeah. Except, except for the traffic. 
<laughs> in the probably the traffic in Florida right. lately after COVID, it's been unbearable. Oh. Yeah, yeah, but everybody's moving from California to here, so come on. Yeah, man. yeah, they ru- you guys ruined this state. No, <laughs> we'll keep <laughs> Anyways, going. We need we need room on the streets on the roads. New Yorkers. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. guys, I Thank appreciate you, guys. you coming on our live stream and and yeah. dropping two new products for us: the in wall speaker as well as the twelve S subwoofer. We're really looking forward to taking a look at. Both yeah. of these products. I'll put the links down below to RSL's uh, website so you guys can look at it. Yeah. We've done a ton of reviews for RSL. I'll put some links in there as well. And we'll be doing more stuff for the company because we really okay. like your company philosophy. We like the fact that you're hitting the price points because not everybody can go to these super expensive products that we like to review. And we get criticized often that we don't review enough budget, good budget stuff. Yeah, yeah. The trick is finding good budget what, stuff. What and RSL is it. Yeah, that's yeah. not good. Like you said, good. Yeah. RSL is really well, honed in on that. Yeah. And our, our website, just so you know, some of this stuff is not, uh, it'll be, uh, if it's not up, it'll be up soon in the, next, in the coming weeks. So uh, just stay tuned if you don't see information on it. Awesome. Well, guys, I think that's a wrap. Don't forget about our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audiohawks. We appreciate your support. You get direct access to us if you want to suggest video topics i'll also put this powerpoint on our patreon so you guys can look at it zoom in on it and see the graphs better and it's just fun to follow along with the live stream drew howard don appreciate you guys and until thank next time thank you thank you guys till next time my friends keep, keep listening, listening.